Hey, good morning. Did everybody enjoy Chuck Missler last week? Yeah. Did he kind of get into your head? <laughs> that brother, he's just, he's deep like the ocean. <laughs> okay. Um, my wife and I went to the desert. We took a weekend and uh, just, you know, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> Had to get that flame burning. <laughs> so uh, I was thinking about not coming again this week. <laughs> But we had a good time. Uh, we actually went to the place we're going to have our marriage retreat in July. And it's a, they have thir- 42 pools. 40. I, I, when I read that, I was like, you're lying. <laughs> they have 42 pools. I counted them. <laughs> so we're going to have a good time. Um, real quick, we got a lot to go over today. Uh, next week, we're going to hit Genesis 5 and 6. We're going to talk about um, uh, one of the reasons that God flooded the earth, which was sexual immorality strange union okay I say that because um, we're gonna have a book that is related to our strange union of the day which is gay marriage uh, two Thursdays ago I got asked to do an interview with Kimberly Hunt uh, on a show that aired Sunday morning last Sunday morning at 10 o'clock and it was 15 minutes uh, Dana Sturge and I had 15 minutes to talk against gay marriage, and, and after us, the ACLU had 15 minutes to talk for gay marriage. And I'm not going to get into all of it today. We'll have the book for you next week. But let me just very quickly, if I can, say this is an issue you have to be praying against and you have to be educated in. And I want to skip to the end. If it happens, here's what the door opens up for. If a man is allowed to marry a man, a woman is married to, allowed to marry a woman, it is not that simple. What will happen by allowing a man to marry a man, what they're really going to legislate and what the legislation will really allow is for anybody of a consent age and any group of people of a consent age to marry any group of people of a consent age. So that means two men can marry three women. If the consent age is down to 16, 17 years old, an adult man can marry a a teenager. Because the, the argument is not that one man should marry a man. The argument is that whatever heterosexual couples have a right in marriage should be given to everybody so that means anybody can marry anybody and so what happens is you have these kids now who are going to be confused about what gender is in other words my mommy is a man my daddy is a woman or the husband is a woman and the wife is a man you're talking about poisoning the whole and destroying the whole concept of marriage the whole concept of gender they are teaching in in New York right now that to children from kindergarten up that, uh, or this is a bill to, to do this, uh, that gay and lesbian and cross-dressing is normal. Imagine your kids being taught that. You're seven years old, and they can teach you that if you have feelings for your, and you're a kid, a boy, and you have feelings for your buddy, that you can be, you can be boyfriend, girlfriend. I mean, this is, this is where our country's going. This is crazy. It has nothing to do with people loving each other. People love each other every day don't need to get married. Okay? You don't need to marry everybody you love. It's just, it's just not right. It's so beyond ridiculous. So anyway, I, I want, I, we're going to talk about that next week. We're not going to talk about that issue as much as what's in the Bible about strange union. But it, the reason that God flooded the earth was sexual immorality. We're going to see next week. And God is going to judge this country. We as Christians need to understand this. It's not a discrimination thing. We discriminate every day. If I go into a woman's bathroom, I'm going to get in trouble. And I I should fight for the right to go into a woman's bathroom. When there's women in it. It's it's just wrong. Stop. You don't go into a woman's bathroom. There's things we don't do. And this is one of the things you don't do. Okay? There's certain things that is wrong. And and, uh, uh, when I was on the show... can't do this too long, but I was on the show, Kimberly Hunt said, well, Miles, aren't you, and Kimberly Hunt was great, she's a Christian, she was great, and um, it was a great interview, but she says, aren't you being intolerant, and some people will think you're being intolerant, I said, well, I never claimed to be tolerant, <laughs> now, if you claim to be tolerant, now, some of you may say, well, I disagree, why can't you be tolerant, here's what tolerant means, tolerant means that everybody's opinion is equally right, I respect your opinion just like I respect mine, that doesn't make any sense, Somebody's got to be wrong. And so, so you, can't, you can't be driving down the street 90 miles an hour, a cop stop you and say, listen, can you tolerate me? <laughs> You're wrong. Now, 
if someone if someone says to you, if someone say, and I also, if someone says to you, well, you're being intolerant. Why can't you just accept this? Are you tolerant? Yes, I'm tolerant. Well, tolerate me then. <laughs> tolerate my beliefs. Tolerate my right to disagree. Tolerate my right to believe the Bible. Because if you don't tolerate my right to believe the Bible, you're the intolerant one. And you claiming to be tolerant or the hypocrite. I'm not claiming to be tolerant, so I'm not the hypocrite. You are. <laughs> okay, let's, let's see your Bible. Word, 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 word. Hands, lesson plan. Genesis 4, Genesis 4. But, but, but as we turn to Genesis 4, understand this is, not a, uh, this is not a gay bashing thing. It's about what is biblically correct. Don't be led into this thing. You're Christians. You're supposed to love people. Loving people does not mean uh, 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 unconditional love does not mean unconditional approval. You love your kids, you discipline your kids, there's a right, there's a wrong, and we have to decide and believe that the Bible is right. God is right, and if you go against the Bible, you are wrong. Amen. That has nothing to do with loving somebody. Loving somebody is telling them the truth. So that, that's really the issue here. Um, Genesis 4. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you so much for your faithfulness. We thank you for your goodness. We thank you for <clears throat> your word. We pray that you encourage us today through your word. Encourage us to be our brother's keeper. In Jesus' name, amen. There are some people that we all know, and some of us may be that person, who live self-destructive lives. They're bent on destroying their own life. They're bent on destroying the lives of others. They're bent on, uh, and some to the point of murder, some to the point of gossip, rape, etc., etc., etc. They live in a, life, in, in a world of self destruction or life destruction. I was watching Cops yesterday and, and America's Most Wanted, and I watched these shows kill, it breaks my heart to see human beings destroy their life. To just see somebody on TV high, strung out, PCP, guy was on uh, meth yesterday, he was just sweating. He was, it was a show on, uh, Cops were doing Spokane, Washington, and the cop had on a bulletproof vest, the shirt, and an undershirt, and he wasn't sweating. And this kid had on, this man had a t-shirt on, and he was just sweating because he was, he, was, he was hot. Just in the back seat of the car, handcuffed. And it's sad to see people just destroy their life. We're going to look at the first murder in the Bible. A lot of things began in Genesis. Today we're going to look at the first murder. And we're going to look at Cain who killed his brother Abel. And what we're going to learn is what really is going on when two people have a battle with each other, have a conflict with each other. And so let's look at this real quick. Genesis 4, verse 1. It says, Adam knew his wife, and she conceived and bore Cain. And that word knew means that they knew each other intimately. It says, I've acquired a man from the Lord. Verse 2, she bore again this time Abel. Abel was a keeper of the sheep. Cain was a tiller of the ground. In the process of time, it came to pass that Cain brought an offering of the fruit of the ground to the Lord. Abel also brought the first things of his flock and their fat. And the Lord respected Abel and his offering, but he did not respect Cain and his offering. And Cain was very angry, and his countenance fell. So the Lord said to Cain, Why are you angry, and why has your countenance fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? If you do not do well, sin lies at the door, and its desire is for you, but you should rule over it. Now Cain talked with Abel, his brother, and it came to pass when they were in the field that Cain rose up against Abel, his brother, and killed him, K-I-L-T. The Lord said to Cain, where is Abel, your brother? And he says, I do not know. Am I my brother's keeper? Is my brother's health, well-being, safety, spiritual condition my responsibility? Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. It is your responsibility. That's why it's our responsibility to teach the truth and love and say what the Bible says, not let people think what they want to think. Because when man does what's right in his own eyes, we have trouble. We have anarchy. That's what happened in, in San Francisco. Mary just said, I'm going to do what I want to do. I'm not going to obey the law. You can't do what you want to do. You all know that growing up with your parents. If your parents let you do what you want to do, you've probably been had trouble all your life dealing with authority. But that's another story. I said probably because it's not always true. Verse 10, and he said, what have you done? The voice of your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. So now you are cursed from the earth, which has opened its mouth to receive your brother's, brother's blood from your hand. Verse 12, 
When you till the ground, it shall no longer yield its strength to you. A fugitive and a vagabond, you shall be on the earth. Cain said to the Lord, My punishment is greater than I can bear. Surely you have driven me out this day from the face of the ground. I shall be hidden from your face. I shall be a fugitive and a vagabond on the earth. It will happen that anyone who finds me will kill me. And the Lord said, Therefore, whoever kills Cain, vengeance shall be taken on him sevenfold. And the Lord set a mark on Cain, lest anyone finding him should kill him. Look in your notes. The first step to being your brother's keeper, the first step to being able to care for, nurture, encourage, be there for your brother. And then your brother, who's your brother? Everybody. Good Samaritan, who's my neighbor? Everybody. Even the people that don't like you. They're your brothers. They're your neighbors. These are the people we need to be responsible for, pray for, be a spiritual light to. You're not a spiritual light. I heard... uh, Uh, I think it was Rick Warren at a conference the other day say uh, we need to love um, real people not just ideal people you know we 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 like oh well I'm gonna go to the church that has no problems well you ain't going to church then (laughs) I'm gonna like people that are that are that are always nice and got all that stuff together well you're gonna be all by yourself matter of fact you can't even be with yourself So we need, we need to see the love real people, which is people who are alive <laughs> and breathe air. <laughs> Look at your notes. Offer, the first key to being your brother's keeper is to offer the right sacrifice. Offer the right sacrifice right in the space there, Hebrews 9.22. Hebrews 9.22. Let's read verse 3. It says, in the process of time, it came to pass that Cain brought an offering of the fruit of the ground. Abel also brought of the first thing of his flock. And the Lord respected Abel and his offering, but he did not respect Cain and his offering. Hey, let's back up here. Cain and Abel both had the same parents, both had the same neighborhood, same Pop-Tarts, same television shows, same jungle gym, same kindergarten, first grade, second grade, third grade teacher, same school. Are you with me? So they had everything the same. One, can't, one, one guy was a murderer and one guy was not. They can't say, well, you know, I had a different environment. No, no, no. They had the same, everything was the same. It's not your environment. It is not your environment. It's not your family. All well, those things affect you, but there's something that can affect you even more so, which is your responsibility. And what happened was Cain and Abel were taught by Adam and Eve that if you want to sacrifice something to God, it's got to be alive. How do we know that? Adam and Eve tried to cover their sin with fig leaves, if you remember, when they sinned in Genesis 3. And God at the end of Genesis 3 said, no, not fig leaves. I'm going to kill an animal and shed blood. He instituted blood sacrifice in Genesis 3. We saw that two weeks ago. And so they knew you have to kill an animal to atone for sin or to have forgiveness of sin. That's why Jesus died. It was his bloodshed. That will atone for your sin. That will pay the price for your sin. Cain and Abel knew that. Cain, Abel, gives of the first sling, firstborn of his flock. He gave a lamb that was slain. Jesus is the lamb that was slain. Here we see that in Genesis 4. A lamb being slain, the firstborn lamb being slain in Genesis 4. So Abel understood, here's the rule. Bloodshed, a lamb of the firstborn of his flock. It's all through the Bible. Cain said, no, 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 I'm going to give God what I want to give God. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a farmer, so I'm going to give God, God some farm stuff. Well, you can give God some farm stuff, but not for your sin. Let me tell you something. The only thing is, in other words, all y'all have different gifts. Some of y'all uh, financially give more than others. Some of y'all give up your experience. Some of you have expertise you can give the church, et cetera, et cetera. Some of you uh, can, can be in prayer ministry, administrative ministry, whatever. That's all one thing. That's service. But we all have to have Jesus as our Savior. His blood is the only thing that's going to forgive all of us. So Cain and Abel knew that. Cain says, I'm going to give God, instead of bloodshed, I'm going to give God of the, of the fruit of the ground. And God said, no, 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 you don't understand. <laughs> it don't work that way. Your problem is going to start right now because you're not giving me the right thing. So the first thing you've got to do is give God your right sacrifice. Look what it says next. First, the next thing you have to recognize that this, recognize the spiritual battle within every relationship. Recognize the spiritual battle within every relationship. Write down in that space Ephesians 6.12. 
Ephesians 6.12 says, We do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but, but against principalities, against powers, against rulers of the darkness of this age, against the spiritual host of wickedness in the heavenly places. What does that mean? That your problem, when you have a problem with a person, it ain't with that person. Your problem is with God and the devil in that relationship. Example, how many times have you ever had an argument with somebody? And I'm not talking about a shout match. I'm talking about a fight over a few days, a few weeks, a few years, and you're battling with this person, and you guys just don't get along. And or you have a disagreement with somebody, only to find out later that what you perceived to be what they said was not what they said. What you perceived to be what they meant was not what they meant. Where did you get that idea? I had a, a meeting Friday with a pastor of a church. His church is five years old. They're local here. He called up the church. He wanted to meet me and talk about church, leadership, stuff like that. He's 30 years old. So we met. We met for about an hour and a half, hour and 40 minutes, and he asked all these questions and, you know, about this and that, this and that and everything. And at the end of the conversation, he said, okay, thank you very much. You know, I appreciate you spending time, blah, blah, blah. And I said, wait a minute, I got a question for you. Did this meeting go the way you thought it would go? Was your perception of me before you came the same as it is now? He says, he started laughing. Oh, no, don't ask me that. Don't, uh, 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 you know, I, I said, no, no, I want to know. He said, no. I said, well, what did you think it happened? He said, I thought we were going to have disagreements and have to butt heads, and I was going to have to disagree with you when we were going to, there was going to be confrontation. I said, why did you think that? He said, I, you know, I figured you were this, 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 and you were going to tell me if I don't do this, this, blah, 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 and I was going to have to say no. I disagree. The devil had already prepped him for an argument. The devil had already got, had started prepping him, and here's how it's going to be. Now, I'm not saying he's a bad guy. The devil does that to all of us, don't he? It's a spiritual battle. And so if there's somebody in your life that there's something not wrong, it's not them. I'm not saying they're perfect, and neither are you. It's the devil. Because if, your relationship, if you give God the right sacrifice, in other words, your broken heart, and Jesus Christ is truly your Savior, and you are truly, sincerely walking with God, guess what? You'll be helped to get along with and love everybody. Now, you may not necessarily hang out with them. There's people just, we, you know, you know, you know some people just don't click. <laughs> I'm not talking about, you know, I, yeah, praise the Lord, praise the Lord. I don't want to see you again, though. No. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about? Say amen, you know. And then other people, you just meet them and you just go, ah, yeah, yeah, I want to be with you. I don't want to, uh, yeah, I, I love you, I love you. <laughs> Because people just are more compatible. But you know what? The reason we get angry with people is because we don't get what we want. Matter of fact, the number one and the number two and the number three and the number infinity reason people get mad. There's only one reason. One reason we get upset. We don't get our way. Next time you get mad, tell yourself you're being a baby. I want my way. That's the all. Now, here's what a spiritual mature people, well, I'm justified. I think it's wrong. Oh, all of a sudden now you know right from wrong. All of a sudden you know everything about everything. <sighs> we don't get our way. But if your relationship with God is right, guess what? God will be the one to tell you. You know, you know, you know the best way and the, the, the best way to never get mad ever again? The reason you get mad is because you don't get what you want. If you don't ever want to get mad again, don't ever want anything. Wow, come on. No, 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 really, for reals, for reals. Don't ever want anything. In other words, in other words, uh, 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 think about next last time you got mad. Why did you get mad? You didn't get a good seat at the game? Hey, well, don't care what seat you get. Just take what God gives you. Fellas, uh, you know, stuff ain't happening with your wife <laughs> like you want. <laughs> just say, okay, whatever, you know, I'll just let God do that, deal with that. You don't get the money you want? God, if that's God's will, you know, I'm, I'm going to let God dictate my life. I'm not going to dictate my life. And so if you give God the right sacrifice and you say, God, I realize I'm in a spiritual battle. I can't fight this spiritual battle on my own. I need to surrender it all to you. If you do that, guess what? People talking behind your back, people saying this about you, people saying this about you. I was watching uh, uh, Larry King yesterday. Donald Trump was on talking about The Apprentice. 
I, I've watched The Apprentice like five times. He's a trip. You're fired. And, uh, <laughs> that is the hardest thing in life to do is, 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 is firing people and doing that. It is, it's hard. But that brother just, he, he like has fun at it. You're fired. Matter of fact, he, has, so he does it with two hands. You're fired. <laughs> Someone called up and said, Mr. Trump, we really appreciate your show, blah, blah, blah. Mr. Trump, can you tell us how do you deal with stress? I watched an A&E special on Donald Trump, and I'm not going to get into it, but I, was, I, I, I acquired so much respect for him as a businessman when I watched his show, and basically all his top guys, his three top, his top advisors died. He was in hundreds of million dollars of debt. It was all happening at the same time. And he decided, and he, and he was broke, I mean, cash-wise. And he was in debt. And his guys died. And all this other stuff was happening. There was a divorce. And it was all happening. And you know what he did? He built another building. <laughs> he went to the bank, reorganized some stuff, built the building, and now he's back. I was like, man. He didn't go, oh, I guess I'm done. Oh, I guess God's telling me to stop. Oh, he, and, and God said, no, 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 no. Let's go, man. Anyway, they asked him yesterday, how do you deal with stress? He says, nothing matters. Basically, he says, when the earthquake in Iraq and 400,000 people die, that's important. He says, nothing matters. Now, I'm not saying nothing matters, but what I'm saying to you is that when you're walking with God, nothing matters except what God said. If you can get that attitude, oh, brother, all the people who talk about you, all the people who hate you, all the people who spitefully use you, steal from you, you'll be able to love them. You'll be able to encourage them. You'll be able to pray for them. You'll be able to be their brother's keeper. Let me look at number three. Resist temptation. Resist temptation. Look at verse 6 and 7. So the Lord said to Cain, why are you angry? Why has your countenance fallen? Cain, why are you tripping? Watch this. Cain's walking along. He's all happy. Abel gives the offering. Thank you, God. Cain gives the offering. God says no. And then Cain cops an attitude. And then God says, why are you angry? Look what it says in verse uh, 6. The Lord said to Cain, why are you angry? Why is your countenance falling? Verse 7, if you do the right thing, you will be accepted. If you do not do the right thing, sin lies at the door and its desire is for you, but you should rule over it. He says, Cain, Cain, if you just do what you're supposed to do, everything will be fine. But if you don't do what's everything, if you don't do what's right, if you don't give me your heart, if you don't let me be your God and rule and follow me correctly, you're in trouble. Period. That's why this whole tolerance thing is all messed up. You can't just do what you want. How many of y'all, you don't have to raise your hand or, or make it, say anything, but how many of y'all when you grew up could do anything that you want in your house? Man, not only did I get a whooping from my father and mother, I got whooping from neighbors. When you, when, when, and I, I know all, y'all know what I'm talking about, your neighbors would watch you. And if you did something in your neighborhood and your neighbor was over there, your friend's mother and father, you knew they were watching and they were going to squeal on you. Me and my friend, when I was, I can't remember how old I was, 10, 11, my friend and I went to the grocery store and I didn't know he was going there to steal. I really didn't. Until after we went through every aisle and had 20 items in a bag. I'm thinking to myself, don't we usually get the bag after we pay? <laughs> I was that stupid, you know what I'm saying? I was, I was, something ain't right here. So we go down, every, I, we took something from every aisle just about, I'm walking with him, just walking, being all stupid and ignorant. And all of a sudden, the, the manager store comes over and says, uh, can I talk to you two guys? And I was like, we're in trouble. I knew. <laughs> I fast forward that bad boy to having a red booty <laughs> and being in my room till I was 20. <laughs> His mother came there. All of a sudden, I, we were in the back. I was scared to death. My father was a cop. I was scared to death. And all, all I remember turning around and hearing go, plack, because his mother came out there and smacked him right in the face. And then she looked at me and says, you know better. She was right. I went home. They, we all three walked home. <laughs> my mother was there. And my mother, she, says, she said to me, I'm not going to tell your father. She was in a life preservation mode. <laughs> <laughs> I 
because if I tell your father I'm going to lose my son, <laughs> you couldn't do what you wanted to do. You know what God says, Cain, if you do what's right today, you're a sinner. The Bible says all sin. If you ask Christ to forgive you, that's why he died, you'll be accepted. No matter what you've ever done, that's how great God is. But if you say, God, God, I'm on my own on this, the Bible says the penalty of sin is death. You're going to die and be separated from God. Look at your notes. Resist temptation. Resist temptation. Verse 7, if you do well, you will be accepted. If you do not do well, sin lies at the door. Its desire is for you, but you should rule over it. Sin is at the door. I'm going to do this till you get irritated. Are you irritated yet? Say amen if you're irritated. My brother played for the Philadelphia Eagles. 1987, 98, 89, something like that. And Keith Jackson, who was, he was a, my brother was a quarterback. Keith Jackson was a, a tight end. They both got saved at the same Bible study. Reggie White, who was a defensive lineman, was doing the Bible study. Reggie White was 6'5", 300 pounds. Talk like this. He said, okay, we're going to do the alt call, and all y'all need to get saved right now. Okay. <laughs> and everybody got saved. <laughs> so my, So that night, that very night, Keith Jackson, my brother, go back to the room. They're roommates. It was a training camp. He gets on the phone, calls all his girlfriends up. Uh, it's over. I got saved. No more. It's over. I got saved. No more. This is, this is a true story. It's over. I got saved. Don't, don't call me no more. It's over. <laughs> that night, they knock on the door. He's in training camp. It's security. Somehow they got up there. It was like 1130 after curfew. And these several, two or three girls come in, jump on Keith. He's like, oh, and my brother's like, be strong, Rumi, be strong. <laughs> Sin will follow you. Sin will pursue you. You turn the TV, it's on. Turn the radio, it's on. You go out your door, it's on. You come to church, it's everywhere. It will follow you. Some people are a magnet for trouble. We know those people. They just, I don't know what it is. But it will follow you. You know what the God, the, God, the Bible says in James, in number three, it says resist temptation. James 4, 7. James 4, 7 says resist the devil and he will flee. You can't resist him on your own. You have to resist him by submitting your life to Jesus Christ. You resist him by submitting to Christ. You resist him by abiding in Christ. You resist him by prayer, by reading the word, speaking the word, talking the word, living the word. Write down 1 Corinthians 10, 13. says, no temptation is taken, overtaking you except what is common to man. God will always provide a way out. Number five. Um, number four, realize justice is mine, says the Lord. Romans 12, 19. Romans 12, 19. It says in verse 9, the Lord said to Cain, where is Abel your brother? And he says, I do not know. Am I my brother's keeper? He says, what have you done? The voice of your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. So now you are cursed from the earth which has opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. God will repay. Let God deal with your light work. Do not take vengeance in your own hands. Number five, accept the ramifications of sin. Write down Romans 6.23. The penalty is death. If you decide to take matters into your own hands, if you decide to do your own thing, if you decide to sin, you will pay. You will pay. And let's look at how Cain paid. One, your livelihood could be cut off. You ever known anybody who has a criminal record? Ask them how easy it is to get a job. Have you ever known anybody who has a bad reputation in their field? Ask them how hard it is to get a job. See, your word gets out. Look what it says in verse 12. When you till the ground, it shall no longer yield its strength to you. A fugitive and a vagabond, you shall be on the earth. Look at verse 13. Cain said to the Lord, my punishment is greater than I can bear. Number B, an overbearing burden could result. One of the biggest reasons for stress is sin. 
And not only the sin of worrying, but the sin of having done something or not having done something you should have done and feeling guilty about that. Hey, you go out and do something you shouldn't do, you're going to have a burden. It's not only going to be a self-imposed burden of your emotions and feeling guilty. It's going to be the Holy Spirit being grieved. Mm -mm. God's saying no. Now, you can undo it by repenting. And that's the great thing about God. He forgives. He restores. Number C, let us see, a feeling of being driven from God's presence could result. Look what it says in verse 14. Surely you have driven me out this day from the face of the ground. I shall be hidden from your face. I shall be a fugitive and a vagabond on the earth. Can you imagine feeling like God doesn't even want to deal with you? Can you imagine feeling like God doesn't answer your prayers? Can you imagine feeling like God is mad at you? God has forsaken you. God will never bless you. God doesn't love you. We've probably all had that to some degree or not. It's not true. Because God never can stop loving you. It's against his character. God can never, you can never be outside of God's presence because God is everywhere. Wherever you go, he's already there waiting for you. And he's, he's still standing where you came from. So you can't go back there and hide from him either. So you can't be driven from God's presence in any way, shape, or form, but the devil will tell you that. Remember, you're not only in a spiritual battle with other people, you're in a spiritual battle with yourself. What does that mean? The devil's going to lie to you about you. God doesn't love you. You're never going to be any good. You're a failure. Da 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 It's going to be so hard. You can't change your life. Don't even try. Go out and get drunk. Go do this. Do we hear that? The devil constantly constantly. That's what Cain felt. Lord, you're going to drive me even from your presence. And look at the last one. D, a feeling of being killable. I know it's not a word, but just let's write it. K-I-L-L-A-B-L-E. Killable could result. You know what I'm saying, right? Look what Cain said in verse 14. He was killable. He says, surely you have driven me out this day from the face of the ground. I shall be hidden from your face. I shall be a fugitive and a vagabond. <clears throat> it will be that anyone who finds me will kill me. I'm killable. I'm expendable. I'm useless. I'm not valued. Who gives you more value than God? God says, I value you so much, I'll die for you. Matter of fact, I'm going to value you so much that I'm going to die for you while you're in your sin. The Bible says when we were sinners, Christ died for us. Not when we were being good. God, you know, you know the guy that killed his, parent, his family up in Fresno? Nine kid, Nine people? Two of them were his grandchildren from his children. He had sex with his children, and they had children. He killed them all. You know what God says? I love him. I don't approve. And if he doesn't repent, he's going to go to hell. But I love him. What does that mean? I have offered him salvation just as quick as I offered it to you. That's love. That's God. That's God. Even though you might feel killable. And what I mean by that? is you feel that you are not valued, you feel that other people can walk on you and it's okay? Other people can mistreat you and it's okay? That's part of this feeling? I'm not that important? God says you are very important to me. And you, are, you have such a high feeling of killability. <laughs> My daughter is writing down all the words that I make up. So she's keeping track. She's, uh, sometimes I, you know the word create, I say crate. So she has all these words, but this is another word, killability. You have such a high sense of killability that you will even kill yourself. When you kill yourself, the pain doesn't stop. You leave a whole lot of hurting people behind. That's Cain. But where did it all start? Alienation from God. You know when people pull other people down? The Bible says the mouth speaks from the overflow of the heart. When you pull somebody down, all you're revealing is how low you are. Because if you're up here, you can't pull anybody down. Well, you can pull down the people who are above you, in your own mind anyway. But if you pull people down, and people who talk about people a lot, people who gossip a lot and break people down a lot, all that says is that they're down here. And they want other people down here with them. Because you can't pull someone down here if you ain't down here. And all that says is that they don't have, their relationship with God is lacking. Listen to what you say. 
Listen to how you talk to other people, other people. It's an indication of what's in your heart, which is an indication of your relationship with God. Because God's love in your heart would not say those things, wouldn't think those things. His words are all filled with grace. Last one. Number six, respond to God's grace. Look at verse 15. The Lord said to him, Therefore, whoever kills Cain, vengeance shall be taken on him sevenfold. And the Lord set a mark on Cain, lest anyone find him should kill him. Now, there are some uh, seminaries who are backwards seminaries, and there are backwards seminaries, who teach that the mark God put on Cain was that he made him black. Well, a couple problems with that. One, you have to assume he's white in the beginning. <laughs> Some of y'all might have assumed that, but you shouldn't assume anything. We're going to talk about that in a couple, three weeks, where all the races came from and what Adam and Eve had to look like in order for all the races to exist on the earth. Um, and it is not what you think. Two, the mark that God put on Cain was there to keep him alive, prevent anyone from killing him. When has being black prevented anyone from killing you? <laughs> the mark represented God's grace. He said, look, I'm putting this mark on Cain because I want Cain to stay alive so Cain can have an opportunity to repent. God put a mark on you, his grace. How do you know? You're here. <laughs> you're listening. You're alive. You have an opportunity right now to say, Lord, I'm sorry. I'm sorry for not giving the right sacrifice and having my sins forgiven so I could really be my brother's keeper. So in a minute, we're going to pray. We're going to have communion. I'm going to ask the ushers to come forward. Two prayers. One, some of y'all need to repent that the fact that you're just a sinner. The Bible says all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. The penalty is death. And the only sacrifice you can give God for your sin is a blood sacrifice. Now, only blood sacrifice that's acceptable is the blood of Jesus. And the other prayer, the other group that I want to pray this prayer, are all y'all out there that got an issue with somebody, <laughs> which is basically all of us, <laughs> say, Lord, help me understand how to be a brother's keeper. Help me love my enemy. You know one of the most powerful things or the most powerful thing in the church to the world is love. Non-Christians may not agree with you. They may not even like you. But no one can disrespect sincere love. And we had that discussion on KUSI a couple weeks ago. The guy was a gay guy. He has a, a living guy, lover, and they have two kids. I think that's totally wrong. That don't mean I have to, that doesn't give me the right to disrespect him. And he can't say I disrespect him. He can say I disagree with him. He can agree that I said that that type of situation is weird and wrong. But he can't say I disrespected him. We don't have that right. And so if we can really be our brother, if we can really have a right relationship with God, we can so supernaturally show love to everybody, whether we agree with them or not. Jesus didn't agree with everybody, but he prayed for them all, didn't he? That's our responsibility. So let's all bow our heads and pray. Lord, we thank you so much for your faithfulness and your love. We thank you for your word. Thank you for the story. and Thank you that you are a God who forgives. Lord, we pray there are people here today who need your forgiveness. They need to offer a right sacrifice. Jesus Christ. If today you know you need to be saved, you need God to forgive you, I'm going to ask you right now to pray with me in the privacy of your heart. A prayer of confession. Pray, dear God, I know I'm a sinner. I pray Jesus Christ to be my Savior, my Lord, my Master. Please forgive me, God. Please accept Jesus' death as my sacrifice. Thank you, Jesus. If you prayed that prayer, just slip your hand up real high. We can see you and pray for you. Good, 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 good. Very good, very good. Lord, thank you for those prayers. 
And Lord, I pray for all the people we have conflicts with, that we can truly be our brother's keeper, Lord. We can truly love our enemies and our friends with your love. In Jesus' name, amen. Two things. If you raise your hand after the service, we're going to have people under the screens that want to pray for you and give you a book. We're going to ask you to come forward as everyone's leaving. And also, we're going to ask you to hold the bread and hold the juice, everybody, and then we'll take it together. Amen? Amen.